What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the J Area Podcast. My name is Jose Ramos Jr. And a very eventful week this past one in WWE, that is, the Wyatt Six made their long-awaited debut on Monday Night Raw in historic fashion. I know I covered this on a previous episode of the podcast, but being that we, that wasn't the only debut we saw, we were able to see also the debut of Jacob Fatu, which is what really has been controlling a lot of the headlines this past weekend. And I look at the the level of importance that a debut has, not only in, in WWE, but just in pro wrestling in general. A debut is a wrestler's opportunity to provide that first impression. And first impressions are everything in pro wrestling. That's why a gimmick like the Shockmaster wasn't really that successful because upon arrival, it was already a botch fest waiting to happen. But looking at the significance of a debut, it's not just the way the individual looks or the way they're presented, but we're talking about the anticipation. Are there vignettes? Are there are there short videos hyping up the debut of this new superstar? How are we going to set the tone in terms of what this superstar is capable of, what their intentions are, and overall just what are they about? Now, it, it can be debated, and it's a long debate between wrestling fans against anticipation versus surprise. There are some instances in pro wrestling where we as an audience, we like to be surprised. I know for me, a lot of times, I like that initial shock value of not knowing what's going to happen. Yeah, you get a little bit of a, an advertisement of what might happen, and it gives you an idea of like why you should tune in. But there's nothing like being surprised with a, with an appearance of a former superstar or a debuting superstar. It, it presents the idea as to why we should continue to come back to the product. And that's what we got. We got one of each, the best of both worlds on this past week in WWE. Because Monday Night Raw saw the debut of the Wyatt Six, which had that level of anticipation. We saw the QR codes. We saw the hints. We saw the clues. We would see bits and pieces of of ideas that led us to believe that this was going to be something special. And, And I think they capitalized on that hype, and they delivered. Conversely, you'll look at Jacob Fatu. There were no hints of Jacob Fatu coming. There was a, there was speculation and rumors that he had signed with the WWE, dating back all the way to WrestleMania weekend. But in terms of hype, there wasn't something like, oh, he's coming, or there wasn't any kind of vignette or video presenting him as some kind of force. Rather, Solo Sokoa kind of diverted from it. You look at the way that that segment had began prior to Solo Sokoa entering the arena preparing for his matchup for Cody Rhodes, he told Paul Heyman, Roman's not coming back. That in itself is headline news. That's something that doesn't necessarily need to be followed up on immediately. You could have left it at that. But when he tells Paul Heyman that Roman Reigns is not coming, that leads us to believe one of two things. One is Solo Sokoa in contact with Roman Reigns. Is this by orders of the tribal chief. Or Solo Sokoa, which is what I think is happening, taking it upon himself. He's taking matters into his own hands. Roman Reigns failed to retain his WWE championship. Roman Reigns failed to uphold his end of the bargain as the tribal chief. So Solo Sokoa, on the very first episode of Monday night, or excuse me, of Friday Night SmackDown, following WrestleMania, spoke with the wise man, Paul Heyman, and they both agreed losing has consequences. Which, in itself, is a very interesting approach to take. Because you could look at it on the flip side. Solo Sokoa had only one victory since the fall at Crown Jewel against John Cena. And since then, he would lose match after match after match until most recently when he defeated Kevin Owens. But then you look at the sense of Solo Sokoa, Roman Reigns loses his title at WrestleMania and the biggest WrestleMania of all time, and it was the main event no less. So losing should have consequences. Every win matters. Every loss matters. So because he was unable to fulfill 
his promise, his end of the deal. That should not go unnoticed. So Solo Sokoa saw that we need change in the bloodline. We need to reestablish ourselves as the dominant family, as the dominant faction in the WWE. So what does he do? He goes out and he enlists the the services of Tamatanga and then Tangaloa. And just when you thought that they were already a dominant force, they add Jacob Fatu. And seeing him be able to take on the top three baby faces on SmackDown, Randy Orton, Kevin Owens, and Cody Rhodes, single-handedly dominating that segment. You would have led me to believe that Jacob Fatu was one of the key players in the WWE had it not been his debut. And that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that the superstar in question is elevated. You want to start off on the right foot. First impressions are everything. If I come out there and I don't present myself in a credible, believable way, then how am I going to be looked upon or criticized or analyzed when I'm up against someone like a Randy Orton? And Jacob Fatu, I don't think there's any doubt. He's a player. He's a key player. The athleticism, the presence, the way he held himself up against these guys. I'm very much interested to see how we move forward because if you've seen Jacob Fatu's other work, like in MLW, he can cut a promo. But I don't see him having a lot of airtime. If anything, one of the immediate comparisons I can think of is Batista and Evolution. Batista and Evolution, towards the end of Evolution, it was clear this guy was going to be destined for the main event run. He was going to be a world champion. But he wasn't given that much opportunity on the mic when he was with Triple H and Ric Flair. And I mean, why would he? Triple H is the top guy. Ric Flair is one of the greatest promos of all time. Batista can just go about his business in the way that he would. I think that's very similar to how they're going to approach Jacob Fogg too. And it's been rumored and speculated that that's because they don't want him to outshine someone like a Solo Sokoa who is intended to be the interim tribal chief. But debuts are everything. And that leads me to this. We think back to some of the greatest debuts of all time. In WWE history, at least. There's been great ones in WCW and AEW. But in WWE... These guys know how to conduct a presentation. They know how to follow up on hype and deliver, at least on the first night. Because like I said, anything after a debut, you know, we can't tell. But upon first impressions, I look at like the Nexus who debuted in 2010. That June episode of Monday Night Raw, when they come out and it's a bunch of rookies looking to make a statement at the expense at the expense of top guys like John Cena and CM Punk in their matchup. And they looked like they were going to be a force. We thought this was going to be promising. You took seven guys who didn't have the the name value or the cachet of like a John Cena, but because of their intent, because of their attack on someone like John Cena, on someone like CM Punk, you're immediately elevating their credibility. Unfortunately, The WWE was not able to capitalize on that because in time, I mean, you guys know what happened. At SummerSlam 2010, John Cena and Team WWE, they defeat the Nexus. But it was the way they defeated them. John Cena was outnumbered towards the end, and he, I believe it was a three-on-one, you know, finish. They DDT him onto the concrete, which for any mortal man probably would, would have sealed the deal. But unfortunately for the Nexus, Super Cena, in his prime, comes back and beats the Nexus. And that was their first match. That was their debut matchup as a group. And they lost. You're immediately starting on the wrong foot. You don't want to take a loss in the first match. Because now it's all downhill from there. Aside from that, there have been other great debuts that have set the stage for great superstars. I can immediately think of three. If someone were to ask me, what is your favorite WWE debut of all time? I come back to these three. And in no particular order, it just depends on my mood, really, for the day. But I'll go in chronological order. 
The year is 1997. The WWE is in a hot streak. They're now regaining momentum after losing so much viewership, after losing so much business to WCW. 97 can be argued to be the beginning of that Attitude Era, where stars like Shawn Michaels, Stone Cold, Mick Foley, Triple H, The Undertaker were all beginning to hit their strides and lead them to victory against WCW. But in 97, in the summer, there was beginnings of rumblings of someone from The Undertaker's past. And this was a months-long story. This didn't just happen out of, out of surprise. Paul Bear, the then-manager of The Undertaker, reveals that he is alive. He's a live Undertaker, and he's coming. And The Undertaker, confused, conflicted, goes up against Paul Bear, you know, grabbing him by the shirt in a threatening manner. And at this time, The Undertaker's a babyface. And Paul Bear then exclaims, your brother is alive, The Undertaker. And at this point, we never knew. We never knew as an audience that The Undertaker had a brother. So months and months would go by, Paul Bear again threatening The Undertaker, reminding him that Kane is coming. And we get lost up in it. The Undertaker is WWE Champion. He faces Bret Hart at SummerSlam 97, loses the title on account of a Shawn Michaels chair shot to the head, causing Bret to become the champion. And as a result of that, he begins a feud with Shawn Michaels. They have a match at Ground Zero. Then they have a match at In Your House Bad Blood in the very first Hell in a Cell match. Which I think, personally, is probably the best Hell in a Cell match. And that's what I'm talking about with first impressions. But the match itself earned a 5-star rating, which would have been the last 5-star matchup since 2011, when CM Punk had defeated John Cena at Money in the Bank. But the match itself isn't what most people remember. Yes, it was a great match. And like I said, I think it's the best Hell in a Cell match the WWE has produced. But it's the ending. Just when you think The Undertaker is getting ready to win, at, his, at that time, his fourth WWE championship, the lights go out. It's pitch black. We start to hear this eerie music, and then out of nowhere, boom, Pyro hits, and we see Paul Bear walking towards the ring, but he's not alone. He's with a rather large, hulking figure, not unlike The Undertaker in terms of stature, wearing a full red bodysuit that seeming that has like a design of flames. And it's Kane. And and the and the all time historic call by, by Vince McMahon, who was on commentary at that time, saying that's gotta be Kane. It's something that has been etched in the minds of wrestling fans for all eternity. The way he accepted McMahon was not I'll be the first one to say McMahon was not one of the best on commentary. He had this this voice, this presence, where it seemed fabricated. And I, I get it. Everyone has like their professional voice that they use in contrast to that of their own. But it didn't seem genuine to me. But that call of that's got to be Kane, I think will go down as probably his best call of all time. So you see him covered up in, in this bodysuit donning a mask one of the coolest looking masks by the way because the story is that the undertaker when they were younger was the son of two individuals who had ran a funeral parlor paul bear worked at that parlor but paul bear would have extramarital activities with the undertaker's mother who would then give birth to Kane, the Undertaker's brother. And the story goes that the Undertaker, one day him and Kane were messing around the, the funeral home, and it becomes lit ablaze. And in the process, killing the Undertaker's parents. And at that time, Kane, at least that's what the Undertaker was led to believe. But over the course of these past 20 plus years, Kane, recovering, growing, and I mean growing because boy was big. Into the force that we saw debut on October 5th, 1997. 
And one of my favorite aspects of it is although he had the mask and the suit, everyone was led to believe that that was because of the scarring. That was because of the scarring and the burnt that he had suffered from that fire all those years ago. And then once he was unmasked years later in 2003, some people were criticizing, well, why he does, he looks fine. It doesn't look like he was a burn victim. But I think it's much more of the psychological scars. You want to hide yourself away from society. And it's a hit or miss for some wrestling fans. That's the way I interpret it. But that debut of Kane coming out and he sizes up the Undertaker, staring daggers into the eyes of the Undertaker until finally he lifts him up for a tombstone. And there's this great moment where Kane, and keep in mind, it's his first time as Kane on television. It's his debut. But there's a moment where he's kind of holding the Undertaker in position for that tombstone pile driver. And he rotates multiple times. And I, I think seemingly looking for the hard cam. He's trying to find the angle that the camera is at. And so finally he drops the Undertaker, nails him with a devastating tombstone, leading to the victory of Shawn Michaels, who would emerge as the first winner of a Hell in a Cell match. And what a way to start. That that in itself sets the bar high, not only for the Hell in a Cell match, but for debuts. You look at the career that Kang would go on to have multiple world champion, tag team champion, intercontinental champion, one of the best gimmicks that WWE has produced, and a part of what I think might very well be the greatest saga, the greatest storyline that they have ever told with The Undertaker and Kane. But then you fast forward a couple years later, and this would lead me to my second out of three favorite debuts. The year's 99. And if you're old enough to remember, I mean, I was, you know, barely one. But if you're old enough to remember... The year 2000 was coming. The new millennium. A lot of people were freaking out. They didn't know what was going on. Apparently people thought it would be the end of days because the clocks and and all technology would reset because it was a new millennium and it became this whole ordeal. So there was a countdown. There was a countdown leading to the new millennium. And on WWE television, there was another countdown. But it wasn't to the end of the year. It was to August to August what would we be counting down and another example of how the WWE builds up anticipation what they do is they have just random moments of raw with the clock counting down until finally it's counting down on the rock the rock is in the ring he's cutting a promo on the big show he's paying no no attention to the clock but then in the midst of his promo out of nowhere we see the countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, and so forth. And then finally, when it hits zero, the lights begin to flicker, strobing with these colorful lights. And then boom, pyro hits. And this music that we're not familiar with begins to play. Until finally, in big blue letters, it says Jericho, and the crowd erupts. In 99, this is when Chris Jericho had debuted. Keep in mind, he was just at World Championship Wrestling, WCW, not too long ago. And he was one of the staples of their mid-card. Being a part of the Cruiserweight division, having successful storylines across the card. But because of the billing and because of the booking that WCW was doing and their failure to highlight someone like a Chris Jericho, who has gone on to have a great career in his own right, you know, whatever you want to say about his AEW run, Jericho is one of the greatest of all time. But you have the countdown, and they do it perfectly. It's Y2K, and Jericho comes out in his ever-so-classic entrance with his back to the ring as his silhouette is lit up, and he has the bright jacket on, and he exclaims that this is not the Y2K problem, but the Y2J problem, which is a great play on the Y2K problem. He claims that Raw is Jericho, and he, and he manages... To cut a promo with The Rock. Now, although The Rock got the upper hand, and it's up to your interpretation on whether or not that was smart to put him up against The Rock, because it did make Jericho look a little weaker in terms of his star power, but it did give him a reason to be a heel. It did give him establishment of his characteristics and what we can expect from a Chris Jericho. But to be put up against someone like The Rock, who at that time 
was one of the biggest stars in pro wrestling and still on the rise. To put him on the level of someone of that caliber, that demonstrates the level of respect, that level of anticipation and expectation that they had for a Chris Jericho. I think that in itself was one of the best ways to debut because you had this built-in anticipation. And it was simple. It was just a clock. And it was a countdown. And we're led to believe well, it's counting down to something. What is it? We don't know. And for me, for the longest time, that was my favorite debut of all time. But I've learned to love Kane's because of that story-driven aspect. And because of how The Undertaker sold it. But then we talk about the ones that aren't announced. The type the type of debut where it's just a surprise, where we're all caught off guard. And this one I I was able to watch live. I wasn't a baby. Years passed by. It's 2012. It's the Survivor Series. CM Punk is in the midst of his 434-day reign as the WWE Champion. In fact, if he were to leave this event, Survivor Series, with a victory, it would crown him WWE Champion for a year. All he had to do was beat the likes of Ryback, remember him, and John Cena in a triple threat match. No indication of any type of interference. No vignettes. No lead-up, no build-up to what would happen next. Because in the middle of the matchup, just when we thought CM Punk was going to lose, and it looked like Ryback was going to win the WWE Championship, three individuals in what is now fondly remembered for their turtleneck sweaters would come out and wreak havoc. And they would allow CM Punk to win. And at that time, this was in in the days that NXT wasn't what it is today. It's not their third brand. It's not seen as an opportunity, a developmental brand for young up-and-coming stars to establish themselves. You had to have serious access to NXT. But for those who did, they would recognize these three individuals as Roman Reigns, Dean Ambrose, and Seth Rollins, who would later go on to be called The Shield. But to see them come out, And the level of intensity that they brought with that attack. These guys knew it was a first impression. They had to bring it. So you see them do the triple power bomb on Ryback through the table. And you can see it. You can feel it. This is different. At that time, I don't think we knew how big it was going to be. Because you look now, what is it, 12 years later. Dean Ambrose now going by John Moxley is currently... At the time of this recording, the IWGP World Champion. He's a former WWE Champion, AEW Champion, Intercontinental Champion, Tag Team Champion, IWGP US Champion. I keep going on. Seth Rollins is one of the best wrestlers on the WWE TV today. Having won multiple World Champions, Royal Rumble, Intercontinental, US, Tag Team, every title available. And Roman Reigns was on the run of his life. For those past four years. Now as the longest reigning WWE champion. In almost 40 years. He's established himself as the top guy. And he quite frankly single handedly. Ran the Thunderdome. With that storyline of the bloodline. These guys changed the business. And now that it's on the uprise. These guys are pillars. Of this era. These guys will all someday two-time Hall of Famers, one for their individual accolades and accomplishments, but also as that group in the Shield. And I know I try to look at it from the basis of you can't take a debut and base it off of their career in terms of ranking that debut. You take it as it is. You take it for what it was. And in that instant, we didn't know these guys. We didn't know what they were about. We didn't know what they were doing. We didn't know why they were doing it. But the fact that they did it, And at Survivor Series, which has become accustomed to having some of the biggest moments in WWE history, whether you look at the first Elimination Chamber, the Montreal Screwjob, the Undertaker's debut, which is a great debut, but I can't put it on my favorite list. Kurt Angle's debut, a lot. Goldberg squashing Brock Lesnar in 2016. This has gone at one of the top spots in Survivor Series, in my opinion, of course. Those three, without a specific order, again, depending on the day, 
those are my three favorite debuts of all time. First impressions mattered, and I think the WWE knocked it out of the park with the White Six and with Jacob Fatu. It's now their job to follow up on that. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to overexpose them either, which is always my fear. Just because they're doing great doesn't mean you want to overexpose them. You want the audience to want more. You want them to keep coming back for more. Because if you give me everything in one shot, then what else is there? I don't think we have a Jacob Fatu match yet. I think we won't see him in a match maybe a month or at least. I think they'll keep him out of the ring at least a month. Same thing with the Wyatt Six. Their first match may be SummerSlam. But even then, I don't know in what capacity. Hell, we don't even know who they're going to be going after. We at least know that the bloodline is in a feud with that top three babyface trio that I mentioned, Randy, Kevin, and Cody. But the White Six, aside from Chad Gable, I don't know who they could be feuding with. And Chad Gable is a heel. Will the White Six be presented as heels or babyfaces? Or maybe just tweeners? Maybe they just beat up whoever they want. Regardless, I want to know what your guys' favorites, debuts of all time are. Do you have a top three? Do you have just a favorite? Let me know down in the comments. Please make sure to sound off. And if you haven't already, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to follow more pro wrestling content, whether whether it's the J Area podcast, whether it's the videos that I place every now and then. For example, we recently just had a video that explains each individual member of the Wyatt Six and why they might fit into that group. But please, go ahead and comment down below. Keep interacting with the video so that we can keep growing the channel, guys. We are just subscribers away, like not that much left. To hit a thousand. Our goal was to hit a thousand by the end of the year, and it looks like we're going to be able to do that before SummerSlam. And I could not be able to do this without your guys' support and your continued love, not only for the podcast, but for pro wrestling. So if you guys want to keep seeing these podcast episodes, you want to keep seeing those interactive videos, please, please keep on liking, keep on sharing, and keep telling your friends to subscribe. Because the more eyes we have on this, the more we can all communicate, the more we can all have discourse regarding pro wrestling. And with that being said, guys, this has been the J.A.R. Podcast, and I will see you in the next episode.